are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I am an idiot. <laughs> but you knew that already. <laughs> I am. I brought my mic with its little stand thingy. I thought, oh, I'll be in business, and it fit into my briefcase, into my ba my bag, really quite snugly, and so on. But it didn't really dawn on me until I just started to set everything up that I still need the other tripod for my iPad. So I'm filming this holding my hand up, and this is going to be a really long Friday read. So no chit chat. Let's get right to the books, and I think my hand might give out before I get very far. Ah, uh, for God's sakes! You know what? I certainly don't have the energy to go back home and uh, and get it and come back here. It's, it's a beautiful day, so let's just go with it. So it's going to be really herky jerky because I'm holding it, and uh, <laughs> uh, and I left house. I'm really absent-minded this morning. I left the house with I left the house without my mask, so I only came a block, but that's not very good. But I hope the the audio was really good because I got the microphone here right. Let's move it even a little closer. There, it's even closer to my mouth, so... Um, there is nowhere in this park to set the iPad down and work the mic. It's absolutely out of the question. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to abort this Al Fresco Friday Reads because my arm is already getting sore and I have so much to tell you. So, let's go back inside. What a waste of time! And before I get myself back home, why don't we look at the Week in Review? I am going to do this as an audiobook and maybe with the ebook as well. Adam Thompson is an Aboriginal writer from the Pacana people on the island of Tasmania. How fascinating. But now let's get a little dirty when we go and look at the Proto Indo European route because to, as soon as you talk about blowing or swelling, suddenly lots of perverted connections start to become apparent. It refers to various round objects and also to the notion of tumescent. Masculinity. The gay man in my readerly brain has to ask this question because when I hear the plot synopsis, I automatically think, is that there a bit of a homo uh, component to their friendship? I'm, uh, a reader like me will see it whether it's there or not, but is there anything, is there anything overt in the story? Um, you know, this is a really fascinating question. Okay, well, here I am back inside. Oh boy, I'm feeling rather foolish. Um, as I spent 20 minutes preparing a document that I went to the convenience store to print out with all my stuff because there was way too much, no, way too many ebooks with long subtitles and whatnot that I, there was no way I, w I wanted to hand write it. So, spent all the time on that but didn't actually reason out that, no, I also needed the, the tripod for the iPad. So here I am feeling foolish. I've got my hot coffee and uh, let's, let's get going. I started two books that I haven't finished, so I will tell you about those first. The first one is the uh, Queen Victoria death book, Curtain Down at Her Majesty's. It's a great, rather irreverent title. <laughs> Curtain Down at Her Majesty's, The Death of Queen Victoria, in the words of those who were there by Stuart Richards. And I'm really enjoying it. I don't know if enjoys. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's really fascinating. It's all the minutiae of the last couple weeks of her life, her death, and uh, I'm now reading the part leading up to her funeral. And from the diaries and letters of... There isn't much from the royal family members themselves, although they're often quoted in the memoirs and memoranda of the doctors and servants and whatnot. So, yeah, there's lots of uh, gossip. There is some salacious gossip, of course. Nothing not, not to do with her death, but just stuff. Like the I've, a courtier, or was he a courtier? I'll, I'll maybe devote a separate video to him that was a notorious better of young men and it's rumored that one of the men that he had a very passionate sexual relationship was his college aged son and he was right in there all to do with the funeral and the preparing for her death and all that stuff so oh my goodness anyway I'm not going to spend much time talking about the emotional component because I don't have an overly emotional attachment to Queen Victoria but you know we're coming up to similar end of an era with the present queen and so it's been a little bit of emotional for me on that level and I'm not going to talk about that 
but I'm enjoying it. I was hoping to finish it, and I didn't, but I will finish it probably over the weekend, because I have another big royal book I'll be starting soon. Stay tuned for that. Oh, and for those of you that who, who hadn't been following along, the reason I was reading this book is that I like to read a book about Queen Victoria uh, every Victober. I have also now finally started the novel from Guinea, which is for Invisible Cities. I'm changing the camera angle and the lighting. The lighting is terrible. There, it's a little, little bit more flattering. <laughs> the Radiance of the King by Camera Lay, translated from the French by James Kirkup, and I'm enjoying it. I'm not loving it, but I'm only about 30 pages into it, 40 maybe. Roz of Scally Dandling about the books warned me that I might find it too satirical. I don't find it too satirical yet, but I can sort of see what she's saying. It's, I'm not feeling attached to any of the characters. I'm interested in the story, and so far the story is this white man who is in, presumably Guinea, but some African country, down on his luck, hoping to be hired by the king. Otherwise, he doesn't really know what he's going to do to make any money or eke out a living. And so then sees the king in this very elaborate procession, and it's very chaotic and interesting, holding my interest. I don't know. I think I will finish. It's a short book. But it's not doesn't strike me so far as being particularly a Sean book, but it's not boring. And unbelievably, given my recent streak of bailing, I don't have any DNFs to tell you about this week. So woohoo! And I have, as promised, finished a whole swack. So that's going to be the bulk of this Friday reads. First of all, I finished this sh collection of uh, Irish short stories by Lucy Caldwell, Multitudes. This was a mm, six or eight week long buddy read with Joe Smith, and. I think this is the best short story collection I've read this year, maybe with the exception of Daddy by, what's her name, the one I talked about with Adam. This was incredible. Have any of you heard of Lucy Caldwell, born in Belfast in 1981? I don't know what her novels are like, but I think I'm going to have to find out immediately. But her short stories are, you know, they're, as, they're almost as good as like Alice or Mavis, published in 2016. This is probably a, as good a place as any for me to declare a new policy with regard to promising that a review is forthcoming. I do do quite a number of standalone book reviews, but I also promise several other books each year that I just don't get around to doing. And what that's about is um, there's, a, there's a pretty short window, like two weeks, where if I don't get the review um, thought out and recorded within that two-week period... It's just not going to happen because I've lost the thread of the book. That's why I hated doing monthly wrap-ups. I hated them passionately and stopped doing them within the f early f few months of my presence here on BookTube. I, I just, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I can't talk about a book that I read more than two weeks ago. Oh, and I don't want to spend the time kind of re-immersing myself in the book to do so. So often that two-week window comes and goes and I'm busy doing other BookTube stuff. And just at, simply don't have, or busy reading or whatever, busy doing life stuff. And so if it doesn't get made in that two-week window, it doesn't get made. So, I'm going to stop being so definitive when I say that I will do a, so, a separate review of books. Because, it, it, you know, I do a fair amount, but I, I don't do, I only do about half of the ones that I promise. So I would like to do a full review of this. We'll see. But I certainly loved the stories. They were all about the lives of Belfast girls and women. They, some of them really seemed like they might be autobiographical, and it doesn't matter whether they were or they won't. They were just really... There was a lot of humor and a lot of pathos, a lot of emotion, really taking you deep into the, the hearts and minds of these Belfast women, childhood and adolescent through to early motherhood. You will be seeing more of Lucy Caldwell on my channel. Next is the, it should really be considered a Victorian novel because it was certainly written and I think completed by around 1880s. I'm not sure exactly when it was completed, but it wasn't published until after the author's death. I think it was published in 1903. The Way of All Flesh by Samuel Butler. I did it on audio. I rarely consulted the free ebook. I mostly just listened to it. It was really easy to listen to. Um, I don't remember who the narrator was, but he had the gayest, campiest voice, which suited the narrator. And I gave it four stars. I wasn't invested in the, in the story for very much of it. And then suddenly the protagonist got into trouble 
and I don't think it's a spoiler to say that he went to prison for a little while, and then he became really rebellious against his family and his upbringing and his and his, the, the society, because he had been an ordained priest before he went into prison. <laughs> and um, then suddenly I was really invested. The story got really interesting, and that didn't even that didn't last. So it wasn't so much for the story or the characters as the sensibility of the narrator. And again, really campy, really wise commentary on the lives of this family that he was friends with but not a member of for most of it i wasn't paying much attention to what was actually going on as much as his editorializing and that was enjoyable to a, to the level of a four-star read and like i say it did get quite interesting there for several chapters at around the halfway mark perhaps i'm glad i read it i don't recommend it beyond if you're interested in i mean it seemed like the narrator was in love with with the main character and that was pretty interesting, that there was a bit of a homosexual atmosphere to the way the narrator was telling the story about Ernest Pontifex. And that held my interest more than just about anything else. And I finished as an audio text combo, Cousin Phyllis, which is the second half of this bind up. I'm going to put this down because I'll just put the uh, audiobook thing up. I, the audiobook was wonderful, and I don't remember who that narrator was, so I'll put that in the at the bottom of the screen textually because he that was he did an awesome job maybe i don't remember if i gave it four or five stars it's not the best gaskell but it was excellent i, I loved it i don't know if it's would have been as good an experience just reading the text the audio narrator brought a lot of energy to the to the whole experience for me the protagonist is this rather boring young man who goes to a town fairly far at least far in the days of you know the mid 19th century from his hometown to work and his parents say oh his mother i think says i have a distant cousin who lives there you should look them up and this woman is a farmer's wife and a preacher's wife and in other words the husband is a preacher and a and a farmer and the protagonist befriends gets really gets to know this family and then his colleague gets to know the family and there's a, a romantic plot that is interesting in the ways in which the typical conventions of such romantic plots in Victorian literature, uh, you really get frustrated here. I found it really compelling in a kind of a character study kind of way. If you're looking for a dramatic plot, this ain't for you. But I really liked it and thought it had really interesting commentary on education and gender and even sexuality. There was a bit of a... I mean, I as I as went into the, my bite-sized book chats <laughs> with my chat with Freddie, I tend to see any any relationship between men is fraught with homoerotic tension. I think we can all agree on that, can't we? And there is a bit of that in here too between the, the narrator, who's a really boring guy, and I often bail on books where the protagonist is boring. But in this case, he was such an excellent narrator that I didn't care that he himself was boring, but his um, friendship with the, the colleague was, was pretty, pretty fraught. I enjoyed it very much. Recommend it. Short novella. And I didn't read this paper copy that I have of the Barbadian novel In the Castle of My Skin by George Lamming because I am getting old and that print is too small for me. So I read a scan of this that's on the Internet Archive site because I could make it big. <laughs> and I've, oh my God, I think I read this over four, maybe five months. I've been reading it forever, and that's not because it was dragging. I ultimately loved it, gave it a five-star rating, and it is uh, set in Little England, Colonial Barbados, and it's a really solid literarily satisfying post-colonial novel. It's the only thing that George Lamming wrote that anybody really cares about anymore, and I really care about it. Polyphonic, really interesting, vivid scenes. For example, young boys, I think pre-adolescent boys, watching crabs walk along on the beach, and that doesn't sound very interesting, but the way he writes it, I will never forget it. And their observations of society changing in the small village in the Barbados where they live, but them watching a fisherman cast his nets and them having a long conversation about a man who ends up agreeing to marry two women and, and then he doesn't know what to do and so he sits in a tree in the graveyard and all of these things, these are the really kind of strange things that were 
given a lot of space in the novel that I will never forget. I thought it was excellent. When was it published? 1953. He's still alive. I think he's about 94, 95. And I think that you should try this maybe for Caribathon next year. And last, but certainly not least, I have finished the new Sally Rooney, Beautiful World, Where Are You? And I loved it. I give it five stars. It was not as good as normal people, but it that's, it's still a five-star read for me. This is a Marmite book, and this is people who have very strong opinions and have very strong opinions about me actually loving Sally Rooney, but I do. So I love Sally Rooney because of the one short story she had published. I don't remember what the title was, but it was part of the Faber series. I had previously tried on audio and very early, very quickly bailed on conversations with friends. So I want to go back and try that because maybe it was the audio that threw me off, but I, I love that individually published short story. And then I, I really love Normal People. And I really love this. This is not as good as Normal People, but this is an excellent novel that has flaws that just absolutely didn't bother me. <laughs> certainly didn't budge me off five stars. What Sally Rooney does incredibly well, better than any writer that I that's writing today, I think, is to capture uh, two things, really. But one is to capture the really heartrending um, uh, re three things, really. One, she captures relationship dynamics, particularly between men and women, but also friendship dynamics between various genders. But... Uh, in a way that was, I found incredibly emotionally compelling in this novel, as well as normal people. That space when screwed up people try to get close to one another. And I mean that, and it either works for you, it doesn't. I, I, I get that it doesn't work for a lot of readers, but it obviously works for more than it doesn't work for. And it certainly works for me the way that she makes that scary sense of possibility and danger and intimacy uh, so vivid to the reader. I just, I just think she's incredible. I also love her dialogue, that uh, maybe one of the best writers of dialogue writing today. Just incredible conversations in this book that really uh, captivated me. And I think that her grand theme, I think she's trying to bring other themes into this that weren't so successful, but I think Sally Rooney's grand theme is Eros and Agape. She is, and her characters are, preoccupied with friendship and love, and what's the difference between them, what do they share in common, and how dangerous or ill-advised is it to try to go back and forth between those two relationship models. Oh, that sounds terrible. Between those two ways of relating to each other. Ah, and that's a big theme in my life. And so I really connect with Sally Rooney. I think she is amazing. I will be following her forevermore. As anybody who's been following the reviews or has read it knows, there are also emails, lengthy emails in this book between the two protagonist Alice and Eileen where they wax philosophical and talk about social political matters from a millennial perspective is the world ending why would we bother to worry about starting a family for example when things are so shitty and refer to Wikipedia entries they've read on certain subjects and I could have done without all of that actually I didn't hate it there was a couple times where it's was irritating, but for, for the most part, I found it interesting, but rather tertiary. And if it had been completely stripped out, it would have been probably a better novel, but it, like I say, it was still a five-star novel, but didn't really need any of that. I didn't need it. For some people, that's the, the gold of the book, and I, I, it wasn't for me, but it didn't, didn't bother me. It's really popular to kind of hate Sally Rooney and to criticize everything she does or everything she says or whatever. And I'm not on that train at all. But I do admit that by making a protagonist who is a successful novelist wondering what she's doing that's of any value, is she really helping with any of the big issues facing the world today? There was some angstiness about that that occasionally irritated me, 
Yeah, the very, very, only very rarely. So, and some of those things obviously bother other readers a lot more than they bothered me because for the most part, I found this spellbinding, deeply emotionally satisfying, and uh, I recommend it very, very highly. Go Sally! So those are what I finished. I've had a really fantastic reading week. I've had such a good time and had time to to read and read and read. So I am going to be starting a bunch. I think I finished five and I'm going to finish the Queen Victoria death book over the weekend. So that would be six. I'm going to start seven because starting those seven would only bring me up to 20 books, which is quite manageable, quite manageable. So this is what I'm going to be starting. Four invisible cities this month. One of the countries is Sierra Leone. So, of course, they didn't make the announcement about which countries a few months in advance. So I had time to do the research and pick up, order a book, and here it is. I didn't do enough research that I didn't that I th I thought this book was by a woman, but it's not. The protagonist is a woman, but the author is male. So the path does not die by Petty Hollist or Pede Hollist. I think it's probably Petty Hollist. Sierra Leonean writer. And this novel was first published in Africa in 2012 and published in the UK in 2014. And there isn't a whole lot about the novel. I'm not really sure that it will be for me. I have a backup, which I won't spend time telling you about in advance. But it is a very nuanced but ultimately anti-female genital mutilation story in that the protagonist who's in her adulthood has emigrated to America, still remembers her botched female genital mutilation ceremony when she was young. And I think it was, I shouldn't say botched. I'm not sure botched is the right word, but it, it's not completed because of um, very strong quarrels between various parts of the family about whether this should or shouldn't be done. And so it, it started but not finished or something. Uh, that's what it, my understanding of it. And then it's the repercussions of that throughout her, out her life. I mean, it's obviously, I'm assuming, it encompasses other aspects of life, but that is the kind of main one. It certainly doesn't sound boring. And for Nonfiction November, I am uh, about to start a humongous book about the royals. This one's going back to the Hanoverians. It's called, it has two titles. The, the one that I'll be reading, it's the same book. And I believe this is the American title. I'm not sure. The Strangest Family, The Private Lives of George III, Queen Charlotte, and the Hanoverians by Janice Hadlow. The other title is uh, A Royal Experiment. And there might be a subtitle, but I didn't note it. George III is, was Queen Victoria's grandfather. And of course, he was the king, the mad king. But he uh, and his wife had 15 children. And I think they had a very loving marriage. They had 15 children. Most of them lived to adulthood, I believe. But out of 50 grandchildren, only one was not a bastard child, was not illegitimate. So the kids were just totally screwed up with the relationships and living in sin. And just for, for all the 15 kids, they couldn't produce. So that's how Queen Victoria came to the throne. She was the one that was born in wedlock. So, it's the story of all of those 15 kids and their messy personal lives. Count me in! 700 pages in print form. I'm reading it as an ebook, so it's much longer than that. Ooh, I can't wait. Dan of the Weird Book Book Club, a sadly missed channel, and a good friend of mine. We are doing, it's not a buddy read, but we're going to talk on Zoom later in the month. And this is the last two such collaborations that I announced in advance didn't come to fruition because I bailed on the book. And those weren't with Dan, those were with other people. But uh, I'm optimistic about this one. This is a newly reissued novel through NYRB. The Stone Face by William Gardner Smith. And it was originally published in 1963. And it's about a... Uh, a black American guy who, to get away from the racist, the racism in America, he goes, as much like James Baldwin, he goes to Paris, and then he realizes that he, this is something that you can't ever really get away from, because he's there during the Algerian, I'm not sure whether the war in Algeria had started, but certainly there's a lot of ferment and incredible racism in France against the Algerians, and he 
get ends up getting involved in meshed uh, and in a really complicated way with all of that stuff. And so that sounds fascinating. Looking forward to, to diving into that one. The uh, Zoom chat with Dan is scheduled for the third week in November, so that's why I'm starting it now. And the four books I'm starting for Indigathon. I have a very ambitious TBR, and I chose books, most of which are quite short. So here are the four that I'm starting with this week. And the first one is not short, but... It's a collection of essays on the cusp of contact, gender, space, and race in the colonization of British Columbia by Gene Barman. History essays, and it's a, a chunky book that Jay Shea and I are buddy reading, but we're doing it over two months, two essays a week. Well, the first check-in is next weekend. Uh, I talked about it, this in more detail in my Indigathon TBR. Really looking forward to getting started with this. And on ebook, I will be reading the Canadian, I believe it's a kind of a memoir type book or it's certainly a non-fiction book by an indigenous writer Jordan Abel called Nishka and I talked about it quite a bit in my Friday reads it's kind of a compilation of his poetry he has previously published a few books of poetry his poetry private correspond private letters um, court documents all of which pertain to intergener intergenerational trauma um, within the context of what an evil place Canada is for Indigenous people. It sounds really powerful, and it's probably the lo one of the longest books that I hope to finish during the month, so I'm going to get started on it. The other uh, work of fiction for Indigathon that I will be starting this week is from uh, Native America, Housemaid of Dawn by N. Scott Momaday. I don't know how many times I have said M. Scott Nomaday, but it's N. Scott Momaday, and this is his classic from the 60s. And finally, on audio, I will be starting the memoir by the Poet Laureate of the United States, Indigenous poet, Joy Harjo, Crazy Brave. One of my commenters recently said she has another memoir coming out in November, but this is the one I'm going to be doing on audio. Let's get to it. Thanks for watching.